Hey, this is Vince Papali. I'm a fellow Hawk brother, and of course, I'm the guy from Invincible. And you're listening to Sports and Rants with Brett and Pants right here on 1851. My Hawk brothers, and the Hawk will never die. And we are on live with Coach Rulin, former 76er, 1984 All Star. How you doing today, Coach? 84, 85. 84. I got elected, but I didn't play in the 85. Oh, okay. All oh, right. Well, sorry, sorry, <laughs> so, how you doing today, Coach? I'm all right. How are you guys? Oh, we're doing great. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. No problem. So, being a guy that coached college basketball, you played in the NBA, what do you enjoy watching more? Uh, you know, the regular season, I'm going to go, you know, college, and then March Madness or nothing like that. Having coached and played in that special, but uh, you know, then you can take it to the next level with the uh, with the NBA playoffs, the intensity, and you know, just so much more uh, physically and uh, mentally gifted at that level level compared to the college level. But there's uh, a lot to take from both, obviously. So you've been keeping up with uh, the NBA season this year and, uh, well, obviously the trade deadline yesterday and the college basketball season so far? Yeah, that was something with the trade deadline yesterday. That was like, you know, everybody had to jump in and get something done. Otherwise, it looked like they weren't working. So that was that was, a, <laughs> that was something else. <laughs> hey, what, are your was thought, something else. what are your thoughts about what Philadelphia did with trading two of their rising stars? Their MCW is definitely is already considered a star. I just read an article the other day about Mr. Hinky and uh, kind of uh, kind of got more of a feel for what he's trying to do. And, uh, you know, he's stockpiling assets and uh, he's going to pull the trigger soon, I would, I, would, I would think, in terms of draft picks. And then uh, get Coach Brown in place and then, you know, the process of developing the guys. But... Uh, how long that takes, you know, nobody knows. But uh, it was an interesting article. I just I can't remember who wrote it. I apologize, but uh, you know, there uh, no one you know likes to lose. But uh, you know, that's that's the way they've you know taken the uh, the path, and hopefully it'll uh, pan out. You know, people in Philadelphia are, are very passionate, deserve a winner. You you were in the NBA as an assistant coach. If you were in Brett Brown's shoes, what would you think about how Hinky is handling the team? Well, it's, you know he hired him, so he's on board. They have a plan that they don't necessarily have to share with any of us. Nor you know they don't have to do that. But you know just the things I've you know I've I've, I've read about him. He's he's you know it's a daunting chest, but he sounds like he's up to it, and he's. He's ultra positive, which you know you have to do in situations like that. It's not fun getting your butt kicked, but you know they compete every game, so now, it's not like they're just going out and you know rolling the ball out. They they they're playing hard. That that you, know, you gotta you gotta you gotta hope that the big kid who's sitting out is you know the player that that people envisioned he is. And hopefully. Uh, Noel develops a little bit more. I think you know you got to get got to get more out of him, even though he showed a lot of promise. And then uh, you know they got rid of the, the point guard yesterday, who I like, but uh, well, like I said, I'm not. Uh, they didn't call me yesterday to consult. <laughs> <laughs> now, in in your opinion, you're a guy that moved around during your career. Do you think that will uh, hurt a player's growth, especially a young guy like Michael Carter Williams at the point guard position now being traded. No, because he got traded to a franchise that obviously wanted him, and uh, to the head coach, who's one of the greatest point guards, you know, that's played the game, and and they're overachieving. So if, if I'm him, I'm tickled pink. It's a win-win situation. All right, so now we want to get into a little bit about your career, how you got into playing basketball. So was did you have guidance growing up? Did anybody uh, push you to play basketball? No, I loved all sports. And then, 
I fell in love with basketball the summer between eighth and ninth grade, and I also happened to grow seven and a half inches. So that didn't that didn't hurt. <laughs> 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 and then, then I became obsessed with it. You know, playing ten to twelve hours a day. That's on the asphalt. That's probably why I walk with a limp today. Now, did you always have the goal to go play basketball at Iona, or was there other schools interested in you at the time? Well, I was the number one high school recruit in the country in 1977. I visited Kentucky, Indiana, Wake Forest, Notre Dame, North Carolina, and Maryland. I just happened to be a nut job and went to Iona because of Jim Belvano and I wanted my mom and my family to see me play. How'd you handle that attention with being the number one recruit in the country? Did you feel any pressure that may have shifted your decision? No, obviously it didn't. If I went to Iona over over you know, wow, Iona the gym holds about three thousand people. I chose them over Rupp Arena. <laughs> 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 so can't say I've been playing with a full deck for a long time. Now, you said that uh, you went there for one of the reasons was because of Coach Jim Valvano. Could you just go into detail about his coaching style, what he meant to you? And he, was he one of the reasons why you wanted to get into coaching? Yeah, I'm sure he had something to do with that. It was more so that I you know, I missed the game. I had to, I had to call it quits at you know, 28 when most of the time most guys are coming into their prime. But uh, Jim was you know, a charismatic uh figure even you know obviously more exposure at nc state and then with espn but you gotta remember i I lost my dad at an early age and uh, jim was about only about eight eight years older than me when i was in college so you know we we go kick some butt and then go out and and hang you know i'd I'd go out and drink whatever and he'd be sitting there drinking a little white wine and after a couple of those we'd get him a couple peach shots and (laughs) watch the performance (laughs) <laughs> now, when you were playing under him, like you said, he was still a young guy. Did you see that legendary coach in him? Did you see him going to become that? Oh, uh, he was a great. He was a great motivator. I, I, I no disrespect, but I I learned a lot more fundamentally from my high school coach Tim Clouser and Steve Rich. You know, he was a great motivator. Though I remember the time we were playing. Uh, I think it was LIU, and he had one of these old, you know, this is way before your guys' time. <laughs> I had one of those, you know, it looked like a shoebox. It was a recorder, and he had uh, taped a new Rockney speech from the movie. And uh, all the guys on the team, it was a couple, uh, we all we all grew up together. It was about three of us were Caucasians. The rest of the guys were Afro-Americans. And he plays this tape, and... Uh, you know, everybody just looking around, and, you know, like, you know, they didn't know who knew Rockney was. I was just sitting there last. <laughs> this guy's out of his mind. He's out of his mind. But that was, you know, that was Jim. You know, that's the same guy that would, he would lead the layup line when he played, we, you know, we'd do a fast break drill. He'd pull up at the, at the foul line and shoot jumpers and tell us how great he was at Rutgers where he was a thousand points you know, <laughs> scorer and then the next thing you know we were still on our uh, practice stuff we're outside you know throwing snowballs now he led you guys to one of the greatest seasons in Iona's history <sighs> and when you were ranked at 19th in the country what was that season like for you guys that was the culmination of the reason I went there um, he had always before that, you know, wanted to be uh, Madison Square Garden, nine o'clock, in front of nineteen thousand people, and and beat the number one team in the country. And uh, we almost did that. We beat the number two team, that wound up being the number one team. And, uh, they won the championship that year with Louisville. But yeah, that was a big reason why. You know, a lot of us had gone there and gotten together, and that was the goal. Was there something diff- different about that season going into it? No, it was just uh, the guys that uh, were ahead of me were seniors, and I was a junior, and we had been playing together for three years. And we were pretty good. We lost a year before the Penn and went to the Final Four. And we, you know, we we took them lightly and came back to bite us in the keister. Then we uh, we beat Holy Cross that year in the tournament and lost to Georgetown by like we had a shot to win it. One of my teammates decided he was going to shoot to win, try to win the shot. Missed. We lost by one. I 
played with two broken hands. But uh, you know, we were we were should have should have finished a lot better than we did. But it was you know it was a great year. Now during your time at Iona, uh, like we said, you had a lot of great moments. Ranked nineteenth, you were an All American. What was your favorite moment at that school and during your playing career in college? That would have to be the, the night we beat Louisville in front of 19,000 people in Madison Square Garden. They were ranked second in the country. Actually, that was, uh, God forbid, 35 years ago come by the 22nd of this month. That obviously helped you, the whole college experience at Iona, helped you to get into the NBA. What was the draft process like for you? Did you think that you were going to be drafted at where you were? Well, number one, I I, I lost my last year of eligibility. I signed with an agent. So I, I kind of messed that up. So I was told I was going to be between the 11th and the 17th pick as a junior, which you know was all right if I had stayed in school. Probably was going to be a top five selection. But um, the draft came around and... Uh, for whatever reasons, I fell in the draft and wound up being uh, the second pick in the second round, which is, at that time was the 25th pick. But they say everything happens for a reason. I went overseas for a year and played for the famous Spanish uh, basketball club, football club, Barcelona. Huh? W- w- when, since you were the number one recruit in the country coming out of high school, was the NBA always on your mind all throughout um, college? It, 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 yeah, the last year in high school I started to to realize that yeah, I was you know, didn't really lose too many battles on who it didn't matter who I played. So yeah, I got into college and I was pretty confident in, it, in my abilities. Now, as you just mentioned, you actually played overseas in Spain. What was that experience like, and how how was that different than uh, United States style? Oh, you're not satellite radio, so I can't go into a lot of details, but it was, uh, it made me grow up. I can tell you, you know, there's still a lot of flaws in this country, but it's the greatest country in the world. You know, you, you can, uh, if you're willing to you put in the hard work and to be whatever you want to be, that's, uh, you know, it was interesting. It was interesting. <laughs> it wasn't, 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 wasn't dull. I mean, we've had games where the, Fans were throwing heated coins, and we were uh, escorted off one time after a game with guards with machine guns. So it was, you know, in one locker room in the mountains where there was nothing but a, you know, tile floor and a hole cut out. Wow. I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. Wow. So <laughs> <laughs> that's that's interesting. And then you would come back to the United States to play for the Bullets, correct? Yeah, that you. Uh, been drafted by Golden State and was traded about five minutes later to the Bullets. But yeah, that last part of the reason I went overseas is was that was the last year Ansel and Hayes were there. So I didn't. It's confident in my ability, but you know those were Hall of Fame guys, so I didn't know how much I was going to play. So I elected to go overseas. And then when you when you came back from being overseas, did you feel more confident in your playing ability? Did you feel like you were ready to take over in the NBA? No, I was mad that I had to go overseas, so I was, you know, wanted to prove to people that you chip on your you know, shoulder. I, I, exactly, and I wound up. Uh, we made the playoffs. We were picked to finish, I believe, like dead last, and uh, I made the first team all rookie. So came back with an agenda. Yeah, what was? Can you go into detail what that rookie season was like for you? Was it an adjustment period for you playing in the NBA? Uh. Averaged fourteen and a half and nine plus rebounds in twenty eight minutes. So at that time, they didn't have uh, the following year. It was the first year, I believe, they had the six minute year award. They created that, so I'm, I felt like uh, you know if they had had that award that year, I probably would have won it. But it was it was extremely enjoyable. Learned a lot from my coach Gene Shu, and uh, I. Uh, I had a blast with some of my teammates, all my teammates, and a lot of guys that I still stay in contact today, Rick Mahorn, Kevin Grevy, Greg Ballard, uh, Frank Johnson. You mentioned there... So it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. You mentioned coming... You know, we took the, uh, you know, we played uh, the 
the Nets in a three-game series, and we beat them, and we uh, actually lost to uh, the Celtics the year they won it in 80, uh, I think it was 82. And, but we took them to a uh, couple of overtime games. I believe we won an overtime game, the first or second game, uh, in Boston. So uh, it was just, uh, Eastern Conference semifinal at that, that time. You know, it wasn't uh, like like it is today that many teams make it to the playoffs. You mentioned how you came to the NBA with with an agenda. Is there a different playing style overseas or specifically in Spain that improved yeah. your play or uh, need no, an adjustment? I actually, I actually thought it hindered me because now they're talking about now over there it's it's physical. When I when I was over there, I you know. I couldn't wait to leave college because there was there was a lot of pictures of me back in the day. I'm, I'm surrounded by five people and I don't even have the ball, so I couldn't wait to go someplace where they could only guard me man to man. And over in seas at that time, the refereeing, you know, just the leagues were just starting to, to grow at that time. They were, the officiating was horrible. You couldn't even breathe without, you know, <laughs> fouling out, fouling out. <laughs> wow. So yeah. after after a uh, good couple of years with the Bullets, you actually came to the Sixers. What was it like coming to Philadelphia? Did you uh, hear about the fan base coming in? I had grown up idolizing Doc on Long Island, and uh, I was uh, sad to leave Washington, but happy because I thought the pieces were in place to, to win the championship. But, you know, uh, I... I, as most people know, that I only wound up playing a handful of games because of my knee. I didn't realize that, you know, my knee was going to go south and I'm basically going to have to retire. So, now, an opportunity, you know, kind of squandered, unfortunately, but uh, that's the way life is. Uh, that doesn't happen, then I probably don't go back to school and get my degree. So, everything happens for a reason. That's That's very true. And with with the injuries, you said you your, the injuries hindered your performance and eventually made you retire basically before you hit your peak. Would you say that if you played in today's NBA, you'd be uh, better capable to keep playing with all the uh, technology they have? And uh, you see guys like Kobe Bryant tear something and come right back. Oh, no question. It's a different time. You, know, you can't go back. To, you know, thirty five years. I mean, you know. It's apples and oranges. <laughs> Go back 35 years, you know, who, who, who would have ever thought about the Internet? <laughs> that, that's, never, never mind a, uh, a blown ACL. That's that's very very true. Yes, it is. Is, is there any, anything you take out of your NBA career? Was there any great moments that you loved, uh, great teammates that you played with? Yeah, the guys I mentioned prior, you know, were... were or lifelong friends, and uh, you know, just obviously, you know, to be one of the best and have it taken away when twenty-eight is not uh, a scenario. I don't think anybody would uh, <laughs> dream about by any means. But you know, it is it is what it is. But uh, you know, I can honestly say when you know, I played, I'm I'm sure uh, the guys that I played about played against uh, remember remember playing against me. You mentioned earlier about being in the pros it required you to have a different mentality. And can you go into that a little bit more about what, specifically what different well, mindset you needed? Well, it was just like I said, dude, there was no zone at that time. And uh, even though I became a, a, a heck of a low post scorer, I was still doubled and triple teamed. So that, that that was still happening. But I mean, that's. They couldn't stop you otherwise. No, uh, it was it, you know it was, it was a great you know it's the greatest job in the world. Wake up in the morning, and go play those. Yeah, like you said, you had to go back to it after you had these injuries and couldn't play any longer. You had to go back to it coaching. How'd you get into coaching? Well, I went to see a friend of mine who was was an assistant at Iona at the, uh, when I was in school, and then was the head coach at Florida State back then. And, Told him I was thinking about getting, you know, wanted to get involved with coaching. He said that's great. You know, you'll you to be successful, but you need to get your degree. So I had to go back and I 
did 70 credits in a year and a half. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. going going into being a coach, uh, was there anything that you took from your playing days that you wanted oh. to instill into your players once you started coaching? Of course. You, you take uh, things that you've learned through your through your life. It's just every day as you get up, and you want to you want to be a better person. Same thing as coaching. You want to be a better coach, and you have some things that that uh, you might have think you developed over the years, which you probably stolen them <laughs> <laughs> or borrowed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's not something. Yeah, it's, it's 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 great. It can be frustrating at times too. Now. But it's 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 rewarding, especially the college level when you have somebody that wants to come in and learn how to play the game the right way and, and gets their degree. And, you know, I grew up watching the uh, the Knicks when they won their two championships, so I I grew up knowing that you know that's how basketball is played. You know, and the uh, the uh, comparison nowadays would be you know obviously the Spurs. You know that. Uh, Everybody's involved, and everybody has an impact. Team team basketball. Now, in your opinion, as a coach, what style did you uh, want to have? Were you more of a motivator? Were you more of the guy that taught the basketball skills? What would you say was your uh, coaching style? I would say I encompassed all those things. I think I was a player's coach. And, uh, you know, we played... Uh, like I said, we shared the basketball. We wanted to get up and down, but those were nights when you're you're not going to shoot the ball well. That you, you know, if you're a great defensive team, then you have a chance to win every night. So, you know, it was fun to play for on the offensive end. And if you, if you followed what we were teaching on the defensive end, then we put ourselves in the, to be in every game. Now, you you really taught basketball and coached basketball. At basically every level, you coached as an assistant in the NBA, you coached at Iona in college, and you also coached in the D-League. Uh, what would you say is the difference in skill level between those three leagues? Uh, it does, you know, there's a different different set of skills and athleticism, and, you know, with, with every level that you go up. You know, obviously... To jump from high school to college, you see a lot of high school guys that might be the best player in their area, and they wound up going to a place that's somebody better. And then there's another jump, you know, from from high school to college, from the college to the, to the D League, and obviously from the D League to the NBA. You, you see, you know, there's not a lot of guys that go from the D League that are impact players, but there are. You know, guys that have come from the D, D League and had successful careers. So, but there's you know there's a, there's a difference in, in in all those levels in terms of athleticism and, and basketball IQ. You know, in in uh, D League, it's it's <laughs> there's no you know there's no scholarships and no guaranteed contract. So you would hope that you had everybody's attention, but that's not always the case. To go more into the differences between each league, at, during the college, did you have what, what's your thoughts on the recruiting, and would you change any aspects of recruiting? Yeah, a lot of the, the rules need to be revamped. I'm not the person to do it, though. But uh, you know, we could go on for hours and hours <laughs> about about that. But uh, you know, I, I think. Uh, with the amount of money that sports generates from the TV, that the, these guys should be getting some money, you know, to go to the movies or do their laundry or or go home to see their folks or their girlfriend, you know. I shouldn't ask. I shouldn't be getting like a, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in spending money, but you know, they should, you know, you know you, you've got a lot going on with doing your schoolwork and practice every day, and conditioning. So I think that that needs to change, but. Uh, you know, I'm torn on the AAU thing. You know, in one aspect that you play a lot, which is good, but in a lot of programs, uh, you don't learn the fundamentals. You know, it was something I, I thought I had an advantage over as a player because of my high school situation. So, huh. during 
during the D-League, while you were a coach, the D-League we've been seeing has been progressively becoming more of a chance for players to get their make their way into the NBA. What, how have you seen a change since you were the coach of in, in 07, 08? I am actually, I can't watch it too much. It's, it doesn't do anything for me. I hate to say that. I, you know, there's these couple of guys that are using a couple of teams that are using it as an experimental thing where they come down and they just, you know, try to jack a three within five seconds and score on 70 points. And, you know, you that's feel proven, so- that that's proven that, you know, that doesn't cut in playoff time. So I am. Huh. So when I don't even get any enjoyment out of that, I mean, it's great to see you know offensive basketball, but no one's even trying to guard you. Kinda, you feel as though defeats the purpose, you know. You feel as though it's like an AAU type of style of basketball where players sort of look out for themselves. Yeah, I don't particularly like to see a guy stand with the ball and go between his legs thirty-five times while the other guys stand around. Yeah, it doesn't really do anything for me. In in your opinion, would would you say that a player would get a better experience, a better chance, even though they weren't that guy that was drafted, a better chance to play in the NBA if they say went overseas today than rather go to the D League? Uh, you're good enough; they're going to find you. You know, the the one thing I will say about the D League is it'll never be the entity that that they want it to be until they they, they raise the salaries for the players. Most guys now can go overseas and get two, three times what they make in a year in a month. So, you know, as much as guys want to be in the NBA, you know, they also need to take care of their families. So that's one of the things that uh, need to change. But, you know, let's just look at a number of foreign players are, are now. If you play overseas or in the D-League, I think the uh, chance of you moving back up to the NBA is... It's about the same. There's so many scouts now that are over there full time. There's not too many places you can play and not be seen. Now, as we're wrapping up our interview with you, uh, we would like to know, and the Philadelphia fans would like to know, what are you doing today, and what are you hoping to get into in the future? I'm actually uh, did some scouting last year, but uh, miss it. I'm hoping to get back uh, coaching after this after this this year. Get back in it. Now, would you like to get into NBA coaching, or are you, uh, do you have a preference between college and NBA? Is there something that you enjoy more? Uh, no, I just you know there's pros and cons to both. But, uh, I'm uh, I'm wide open right now, but uh, the NBA season has a long time to play out. We're going to be coming up on March Madness soon, so uh, hopefully some opportunities present themselves. Coach, we thank you for joining us today. We appreciated your time. We learned a lot from you, and we hope to have you on again soon in the near future. My pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Be good. This concludes our podcast of Sports and Rants with Brent and Pan. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on Twitter at Sports and Rants. Like us on Facebook. Remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And visit our website, www.sportsandrants.blogspot.com. It would help our rankings on iTunes if you rate and review our podcast. Thanks, and have a good day.